episode 103 of School Librarians United. I'm your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian in my 14th year, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that all the ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast by myself, by my interview guests, and by people who reach out to this podcast are our own and do not reflect those of our school districts. When incorporating research, I always make sure to cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I'd like to extend a very special welcome this week to listeners in Hungary, the Republic of Korea, Bangladesh, and Hong Kong. This past month saw a surge in downloads, and I am so glad that you have joined our listening community. I welcome you and all listeners to reach out with your feedback and episode suggestions either on Facebook or Twitter or the email address schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include your mailing address, I will be sure to send you a podcast sticker. The inspiration for today's episode stems directly from the popularity of episode 97, Stuff They Didn't Teach You in Library School, and my conversation with Lori Davis, which was posted on October 24th, 2020. While I was very entertained by everything we discussed, I couldn't help but feel a little guilty. This episode presented only a one-sided perspective, that of the student. And I wanted to make sure I created opportunities to learn from the professors in library school. If you haven't already, I encourage you to listen to episode 64, Teaching from Stage to Screen, and my conversation with Dr. Heather Moorfield Lang, which aired this past March, a time we will now refer to as the before times. I was thrilled when Dr. Pamela R. Moore accepted an invitation to provide something of a counterpoint to our recent episode 97. And now for today's episode, Library School Responds, and my conversation with Dr. Pamela R. Moore. so excited to be sharing a conversation with Dr. Moore today. Dr. Moore, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Excited to be here. So excited to be here. I am, you know, so excited to have this opportunity to to share this conversation with listeners today. And, And I'm especially glad that you didn't take offense at an earlier episode we posted titled Stuff They Didn't Teach You in Library School. I thought that that was such an interesting episode when I listened to it and I really went back after listening to think about, man, are my students learning these things? Are are we forgetting to incorporate these types of topics into what we do? And I, I mean, she really hit it home when she mentioned about the book repair. And I thought, I never mentioned that to my students. Oh my gosh. But now as I talk to them, especially those students that are doing internships, I make sure someone shows you how to repair a book because that's the skill you will need. I've forgotten about that. So of all the things she mentioned, that's what I thought was. Well, uh, if that. there's, you know, one takeaway, you know, if listeners listen to a podcast and they, you know, at the end of the podcast, they've got one, one grab and go, one takeaway that they're like, that's it. But, you know, more importantly, when you have an opportunity to sit and listen to a podcast, it gives you that, that opportunity to reflect and you don't, it's not about criticism or looking at things that you aren't doing, but it also is awfully validating to hear librarians talk to one another and go, yep, we do that. I do that. I do that. So I, I'm just glad you're here. Um, you know, talking about library school, would you mind sharing with listeners a, 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 a lasting memory you have of library school? Because my memories of library school are 20 years old. <laughs> Well, we do have some things in common, evidently, because my <laughs> memories of, of library school are about the same. Uh, actually, 21 years ago. So I've got you by one year. But the things that I can remember are, are taking the courses, 
connecting with other students in the courses and the things that I remember learning about so much of children's literature that I had previously had not been aware of. So I think you always remember those books that they really were talking about the, 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 when you took your literature or curriculum media type of courses. I can remember Bud, not Buddy. No, I'm sorry. And the Watsons go to Birmingham. I remember both of those books, along with a few others. But I remember around that time, those were the books that were winning the awards and people were talking about when I took uh, my courses. I think the other thing that I remember, the other lasting memories is we, we were not doing online school 21 years ago. So I can remember the many days and nights of carpooling to my university, which was 150 miles away. And I would leave work and hop in the car and go to class and come back home, get up, get ready, go back to work the next morning. So I remember the trees. I can I tell you the, the the rest areas. I can tell you all of the parts of Interstate 65 that I took to get to class. So well, those are my lasting memories. And and like you, when when I started, I, the the only web component we had were classes where we might use a Blackboard. And we'd check in like once or twice during the semester and have some conversations. And but it, it was never meant to be anything that um, replaced uh, meeting face to face. So it it yeah. has changed a great deal. Um, but I also think that having had those face to face experiences has I, that was something that I sought because I was a stay at home mom with three babies. So <laughs> I I needed I needed human contact and I needed to remember I had a brain. <laughs> so I can truly understand that. I was a young mom and my son had no memories at all of me working on the master's degree because I think he was four when I finished. So we sort of remember, I said, do you remember going to my graduation? He's like, no, he just assumed everybody's mom worked in a library because his mom worked in a library when he was a kindergartner. So he thought that's what people did. Oh, that's so cute. Um, you know, I'd love to hear about when the moment when you decided as a school librarian that you wanted to pursue your doctorate, because that has to be a heck of a light bulb. Because, you know, I remember the light bulb when I wanted to become a school librarian. And thankfully, the light bulb to become a doctorate, that, that's not there because there's, there's, there's a, too much in the way in terms of paying for my children's college tuition right now. So, so my, my own doctorate is going to have to uh, uh, be on the back burner. So tell me about your, your light bulb moment. So actually, I had a couple of light bulb moments. Because initially, uh, after completing the bachelor's program, I was a Spanish teacher, and I, my, my bachelor's certification was history and Spanish. So I was a, a high Spanish teacher, and after doing that for a short period of time, I thought, well, you know, I need to go back and get a master's degree. So I have always been a lover of books. I am a reader. I, can, I can't remember when I was not a reader. So at that time, I thought, this would be interesting. Working in a school library would be something wonderful to do. So I also started to gain a, a, a true interest in educational technology. So as I, I went back to school and got the media degree, educational media degree, and became a school librarian. And at that point in time, I started to get a bit more of an interest in educational technology. So after working as a school librarian for a few years, I got the call, would you like to come and work in our educational technology division at our school district? Because we have noticed that you have a, a way of working with others, helping them learn new technology. And we'd like for you to come and work for us to do that. So I left the school library and became an educational technology specialist for our local school district. I did that for quite a few years, and still that doctorate light bulb was kind of flickering then, but had not completely turned on. 
So I did that. I'm trying to count in my head. I think there was about seven or eight years. I know there's 10 years between the master's and starting the doctorate program. So I was a, uh, a educational technology specialist who had a heart for librarians. When I would go out to a school, my take was once a librarian, always a librarian. So whenever I went out to a school, one of the first places that I would find myself would be in the library, supporting their needs as far as the technology was concerned, but also it gave me a time to be around the book because I missed it. And it would be so funny if I happened into a school and they were doing a book fair, they would have to drag me out of the school because I was like, oh my gosh, this is home. I love it. So I was an educational technology specialist training uh, teachers about everything, training administrators about everything that you could imagine. And that is when the light bulb came on because I started to think, I have some questions and I've wondered when would I get the opportunity to do some research to find answers to those questions? I wanted to know, I noticed a difference between how people use, accepted and use technology. And there were some people that got it and there were some people that in the same circumstance just really didn't get it. And I wanted to know how could I better help them? So I decided to start a doctoral program at the University of West Florida. And there must be something about becoming a commuter student, because even though some of my courses for my doctorate were online, many of them were in person with a wonderful cohort who are people that I could call right now and talk to, wonderful folks. So I started the doctorate program in that. I have to also give a little bit of a plug. I come from a family of educators. My father was an elementary educator, became elementary school principal. My grandparents on my dad's side were elementary educators. My grandfather was my elementary school principal. My aunts, my uncles, my mom really only the only person that wasn't in education. So my grandfather always said, and Pamela is what he called me, the only person that calls me Pamela, calls me Pamela, he would say, Pamela, get your terminal degree. Get your terminal degree. It was something that he had worked on, but we're talking about a person who graduated from high school in 1938. So the options for a person who graduated from high school in 1938 after going to the war, coming back, he got his master's, he got his educational specialist degree and, and sent for for his, my uncle and my aunt and, and my dad sent all of them to college along with my grandmother. But he always felt that that terminal degree was a goal that you should set for yourself. So unfortunately, I did not finish the degree before he passed. But in the dedication of my generation, there's a dedication to all of my grandparents because they contributed so much into me that this was something that I wanted to do. My first dedication was to my son because I knew I was a role model for him. The next dedication was to my husband, my parents, because they supported me in the endeavor. But I, I then went to get the, the doctorate degree in instructional technology from the University of West Florida and took another turn. How interesting. Took another turn. For some interesting reason, I decided after getting the doctorate degree, still doing educational technology work, that you know what, it might be interesting to go get a master's in educational leadership. Of course. But in the K-12 <laughs> setting, they, they want you to have a, a educational leadership certification. So after getting the doctorate, I went back to school and commuted, same university, and I'll say something about that in just one second, and got the, the master's degree in educational leadership. So that school was the school that my grandparents attended. So I was determined to get a degree from that school, Alabama State University. That was the school where my parents met. And that was, I was born on that campus. So I decided that somewhere in my CV, as we call it, in higher ed, or my resume, or my educational journey, there would be degrees from Alabama State University. And my son, 
is now a graduate as well of Alabama State University. So he's fourth generation Alabama State University. So my journey I, I, I is interesting. It's not direct. So I don't think I, I started as a school librarian thinking, man, one day I will teach future librarians and become an educator of school librarians. But that was the path for me. Because after getting the, the, the master's in ed leadership, still looking at other opportunities, uh, the position became open at University of South Alabama. Interview, talked to them, and I'm here. And I, I love it. I, I, I really do. It's, every day is different. It's a totally different world from K-12. But I really enjoy what I do, and I enjoy serving as an educator of school librarians. Sorry, I know that was a long answer. Not at all. I don't think you could have left any of it out. I mean, I, I think all of the components are so important about how your family played a role in inspiring you and, I, you know, your grandparents. And it's like, wow. I mean, I think I'm just sad I don't have an equally fun story to tell. And, I, you know, truly, <laughs> you know, we are defined by the people who raise us. And, you know, when you are as, as fortunate as you are to have so many, you know, personalities and and people in your life who who push you to do what you do because they know and they have faith in you and they you know want everything for you and see that education is the way to get all of those things i i think it's it's an incredible message and you know it, it really does speak to how we evolve into the adults we are because of how much our family guides us in that journey. I do want to go back to something you said very early on, because you mentioned when you go into to schools that you find yourself gravitating to the library and you, you talk to the librarians. And what that, that reminds me is, you know, I'm very cognizant that when librarians learn how to do something. That information doesn't stay contained. That when librarians learn how to do something, we become like the disseminators of that information. And it's awfully efficient, if you ask me, to educate educate, you know, the school librarians, because the school librarians end up passing all of that, those skills and that knowledge onto the the staff who are lucky enough to work with them. So I think that that's really, I see that as as a responsibility. I know when I go to my ed tech conferences, I am learning how to do things, not so much because I need to know how to do those things, but I am then going to convey that those resources and those strategies and those, uh, you know, platforms and educational technology onto my staff. I, I love it. I don't, I, it's not so much a burden as an opportunity. I think it's definitely an opportunity. And I also see how it shows how the role has evolved. Because I can think about I, when I became a school librarian, there were about five different school librarians. Some of these people were ladies who had gone to school with my dad. So they were like moms to me. They kind of took me under their wing and showed me a lot of things beyond what I learned in my program of how to do this. Who do you call for that? And they helped to build my learning community. And I came in with the technology background, even back then. I remember the key thing that we were asked to do 20 odd years ago was how do we find the age of our collection? And we were doing it through a little program in Excel. And, but you had to know how to get that data from the autom- the library automation program that we use and transfer it into Excel so that you could sort it. And for many of them, that was way over their head. They just could not even see how it could be done. So they would call me and I would make my little tracks from school to school to school, helping them. And then those good old fashioned things that they learn that they don't ever teach you in library school. Those things, they they became that person for me. But I also had an experience as I went out in my technology support role to see there were some libraries where people were gaining the information, but they were still looking at their role as a gatekeeper. And it was, this is my realm. I am the queen of this kingdom. 
and you were almost afraid to go into things. It was like a museum, but it's not even like a museum because today's museum, you can touch things. We can't have something not being interactive. And for some reason, many of them felt like, no, you come in here, you're quiet. You don't touch anything. You don't, you come in, you straight out of get and you tiptoe out if you're allowed to come in. And that, that was crazy. I mean, I, I can't think of a better word for it. And I am so happy to see how things have evolved and truly the impact that I make with the students that I teach is that we are always evolving. Just as we did that evolution, there are other evolutions. I mean, especially now with the role of a school librarian, there are other ways that we are evolving. So yes, you learn things for to be a conduit out to other people, but you also have to look at what's next and you have to keep your pulse, your hand on the pulse of what's coming up next so that you can be prepared. And none of us can see the future. <laughs> oh, I wish we could sometimes. <laughs> you know, I, I love this I idea think. of constantly evolving because I, I do, you know, the, the term lifelong learner is, is almost synonymous with everybody I've ever had an opportunity to interview. I mean, you know, across the board, librarians I encounter either in my PLN or as guests on the podcast, we would self-describe as lifelong learners. And I, I think that that was truly hammered into me in my library school experience because, you know, the idea is this isn't the end of the road. You know, this degree does not mean you're right. done. You are not done learning how to be a, a good and effective school librarian. Right. So, you know, just get that out of your head right now because you are always going to be learning. So, you know, I, let's let's uh, share with listeners, could you tell me your official title and your role at the University of South Al Alabama? <laughs> My official title is Assistant Professor and program coordinator for the educational media, which is school librarianship, and the educational technology master's program. So kind of a long title. I've learned that that's a higher ed thing. We like to see how long can our signatures be. So yes, my signature becomes this really nice block of you and you're that and you're this and you're that. So officially, those are my titles. Well, and friends, this is exactly why Dr. Moore uh, was was asked. I, I really asked in the nicest way possible. I said, if you're not totally offended by our episode on on things that we didn't learn in library school, would you please come on the pad, podcast? And and I'm I'm so delighted that you're here. You know, research is something that sets. Uh, college faculty apart from librarians like myself working in, in the schools. Could you tell us, uh, because I know that research is, is vital uh, of, and a critical part of roles uh, when you are uh, part of academia. Um, can you tell us uh, the focus of your current research? That's sort of an interesting question because, yes, research is a vital role. However, in, in my work, the, the biggest charge that I was given when, when brought into the position was, first of all, work to build the program, teach the courses and build the program. And research is a part of it, but research is not my primary part of what I do. So much of what I do are, are teaching the courses within these different programs and also doing a lot of things as program coordinator making sure that we are doing things for accreditation, for state program reviews, recruiting students, uh, serving as advisor for all of the students in the program. So I'm having to do that. The research things that I've worked on have been more in an ed tech framework than in a library, uh, school library framework, only because there, I've been able to partner with colleagues more on that. So I've done some things with computational thinking for pre-service teachers, because along with doing the library part that I've shared, I also teach one undergrad class in educational technology. I mean, my, my background. So uh, I've done, we've done some, some things with that. I've also worked with another colleague to look at using Flipgrid, uh, that, that program for discussion forums in our courses. So that's sort of a 
the scholarly role of, of teaching, best practices in teaching. So we've done that. I've talked to some, uh, uh, actually a, a person at another university quite recently about doing some things now that are more library focused only because I'm it at my school in, in, at the university in, in school librarianship. So I would have to partner almost with someone beyond that for it to be library centered. But we started talking about, uh, some things that we could do on the impact of COVID on in the pandemic and how students are selecting materials because as we move to our virtual platforms and completely digital platforms for selecting materials i wonder as a person who is a lover of going in and browsing the shelves to select books do you lose that when everything is online and there is some browsing that can be done for online materials please don't think that i'm not saying you can't do that but I wonder, is there a difference? I just think about my personal experience when I go into a library and in my hometown, they opened the library only about three months, four months ago. They have opened them back up. And I went on day two after they opened because I had not, I'd done curbside pickup, but I had not gone to our public library and just looked at the shelves because that's when I always find the books that I didn't know that I wanted to read because I didn't know that it existed. So I wonder how does that impact impact our patrons? How does it impact our students when they no longer have that ability to happenstance upon a title that they wouldn't know that they'd be interested in and things are being selected for them? I appreciate what school librarians are doing with carts of books, rolling them out to classrooms or doing curbside pickup. But I also think that there are probably some better fits that are just Students aren't getting what they could get when you're selecting it yourself. So I'm just curious about that as a researcher. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if um, this bizarre year of the pandemic inspires a great deal of, of you know, investigations and, and how this impacts what we do moving forward. You've taught uh, 540 Curriculum Media for Children and for Young Adults. How has this class evolved to better prepare school librarians to address the challenges that they can expect once they move into the library? I think it has evolved in a couple of different ways. First of all, when I first started with the program, it was two different classes. It was Curriculum Media for Children and Curriculum Media for Young Adults which were great classes separately. But as I started to look at, and this is my program coordinator hat that I put on, as I started to look at the standard and look at what what the research said, the needs of pre-service or practicing school librarians would be, I, I saw that we were missing something. And we were missing, and maybe it's the technology in me, we were missing a technology-focused course for school librarians. So what I decided to do after looking at other programs to see how they were doing this, we made a switch. So we did, we started a course for school librarians that is technology for them because many of them don't have the extensive technology background that is now required for school librarians. They are the support person in a lot of cases. And when we put curriculum media for children and young adults together, it became a 16 week, a semester long course where we could look at different types of genres of books. We could look at different types of, of collection development processes. We could also look at the selection of books and we could look at it from the lens of if you are going to be a, a school library, you in the state of Alabama, you are certified P312. So you may be like me. I was a secondary trained person, history teacher, Spanish teacher, and I became an elementary school librarian. So I had I'd taken the course where I looked at curric curriculum media or lit for, for children, but it did not sink in in the same way because I'm thinking, oh, I'll be a high school librarian. I'll be a, a middle school librarian. I won't ever have to do little kids. 
And that was the position I accepted. So we, it, the courses evolved and they look at how you can look at genres across age ranges and also across the diversity of learners today. One specific thing that I've built in a little bit more is addressing how are we addressing the needs of diverse learners and not just diversity for diversity, but diversity for students, if not for the world that they live in today, but for the world that they'll live in once they become adults. So we want titles that are not just what you're comfortable with. We started the course out with what were the books that you read when you were young? And we actually, uh, they actually do an activity where they have to go and interview someone and kind of come up with an assessment a survey of how would you select some books for that person? And we take it maybe about a month and a half later within the semester. And I go, okay, so now as we start to look at the diversity or the diverseness of what's out there and meeting the needs of different types of people, look back at what you suggested that that person would read. Would you have made the same choice now that you know more? And some of them say, yes, this is the book I would suggest for them. Others say, oh, wow, I never thought about books for this. And I mean, when we say diverseness, we're not talking about just in gender. We're not talking about just in ethnicity. We're talking about in or, uh, orientation. We're talking about an ability. We're talking about diverseness in where do people live, where it's rural, where it's urban, whether it's uh, a homeless student or whether it's just the diversity of the world in which we live. And how do you select titles for those students? And you've got to be aware of it. So that course has truly evolved to offer them the window that they need to see what's out there. And how do I use equity in the Germany that I select and I read and explore. I, I just want to be a student of yours. That's that's all. We're just, I'm going back to school because I, all of these things are such important concepts that need to be addressed for these, you know, pre-service school librarians. You know, you touch upon this idea that you had it in your mind, you were going to teach secondary, you were going to be a librarian in a secondary school. Um, that is my story exactly. I was 10 years in the high school. I taught 10 years in the high school. I wanted to be a high school librarian. And I don't think at any point in my journey in library school, did somebody say, yes, but you are certified K-12. You may find yourself yeah. working in you know, an elementary school. And I, if I heard that, I didn't hear it. Like it didn't connect because in my head, my 10 years of experience teaching was exclusively in the high school. And I wouldn't let my brain think, oh yes, but there is a very good possibility you'll find yourself working in an elementary school. Well, I'm just going to tell you what, friends, 14 years later, I'm still in an elementary school. I, I and it has been my <laughs> life. And I'll tell you what, I, I can't see the future, but it, it is very, very possible that I I will still and always be an elementary uh, school librarian, and I think I just jinxed my luck. Anyway, but but I think at somewhere in that conversation with those pre-service librarians has to be this conversation. You can imagine what you're going to do, but until you get that first teaching job and that as a school librarian, you really could be put in any number of teaching scenarios in terms of elementary or middle school or high school. You, you touch upon this idea of reader's advisory. And, you know, I think that's something I really wished I could have practiced in library school is, I, I don't know if you can role play it with other adults. I mean, this idea of how do you do reader's advisory with people who just have never practiced that in a, in a, a classroom situation? I think it's a matter of having them practice the skill in multiple times. Like they practice it initially, not even knowing that that's what they're practicing. And then as they learn more to go back and practice it again. Some of the challenges that we found in, in this particular co course that were COVID related were in the past, I would say go out and 
explore a bookstore or, or explore a public library or explore libraries. And we could not do that in the same way this time. And there is a difference between exploring your local bookstore and exploring Amazon. I'm sorry, it's not the same thing. So we would run into problems with that. But I, I, I try to sure they have opportunities to practice the skills. I mean, I, in one of the courses that I teach is about information literacy, where we talk about inquiry-based learning. And when we're talking about inquiry-based learning, they actually do a project that they use the skill of inquiry-based learning. I don't get too meta on them and don't tell them from the beginning that, hey, you know you're using inquiry-based learning to do said project. Instead, usually by the mid-project, when they're asking me questions and it's starting to click for them, that, wait a minute, we're doing a project. We're using the skills that she's teaching us that we will have to do with our students. And they go, oh, and I'm like, yeah, you got the skills. You just practiced it. So you saw how this can work. And I also, on that particular project, love to have them go and talk with a practicing librarian. And one thing that I can say, and this happens when you're in any kind of education course, that fantasy situation that you think is going to exist generally does not. So take those ideas of all these grandiose things that you're going to do or that you would do if you were in the situation and go share those with a person that's actually doing the job every day. Let them review what you're saying that you would do. Go interview them and say, okay, if I were doing the project, I would have the students do this, that, and the other. Have them give you some feedback. Um, uh, no, this is not realistic. They're in second grade. There's no way in the world that they can do it like this. And they say, oh, I didn't think about that. So I like to bring those aha moments for them where they go, I never thought about it that way. And I'll say this other one thing. I have found that in my time of working with the students, those students that were so gung-ho that I am elementary and I will never do anything but elementary, when they get that secondary experience, they're like, wow, I like big people. And those people who were secondary, who just said, there is nowhere in the world I'm working with little kids, get that secondary experience. I mean, that elementary experience. I love this. There are great resources for all from P, pre-K to 12th grade. And the experiences are different, but there's room for anyone. You'll find what you prefer, but you're trained for it all. You have preferences, but... Our certificate says you can do any of them. That's right. All right. And, you know, again, messages that you need to hear. It, it may take a, a couple times to, to get that through their heads. I, I love the idea of having you an opportunity to, to speak with uh, school librarians who currently are in the field. Um, and, you know, having that opportunity to have those conversations not that you're working together, but just somebody that you could just talk to and, and, and find out, you know, well, what do you feel about this? And Hey, how do you, when you're trying to do reader's advisory with a kid, you know, what kind of strategies do you use? And I mean, you know, I'll admit the first librarian, uh, school librarian I worked with was the one I was doing my, my uh, practicum with. And so I really didn't get Mm -hmm. much of a, a warm up. You know, I, I would love to be a student in your 581 class, Media Center Management class. And that was one of my favorites. I I feel like it's a pivotal class because it's when your classroom teachers begin to understand what sets school librarians apart, that we're the square peg in the round hole. Can you share how this particular syllabus has changed over the years to prepare your library students for their career in school libraries? I think that it has changed over the years, but I also think that in in the way that our program is set up there, you get little pieces of that along the way in other courses. I going back to what you were saying about connecting with other librarians. I really, whenever very first class want students to start connecting with other librarians because you got to build that network. If there's one thing that I can say about being a school librarian is it is a isolating job. There is no one else on site unless you're one of those people at a huge school where you have two of you. There's no one else on your campus that knows exactly 
what you do, but they all become experts on telling you how to do it. But they don't know what you do, but they are truly experts on your best, what they feel that you should do, your best practices. So I want them to build that network or start building that network as early as possible, whether they're building it through talking to people in person, talking to people through social media, following people like this podcast. I want them to start building that network as early as possible because I know from experience you're going to need it. You're going to need that bigger world to say, this is how we do things. So for us, that course is about the professional responsibilities of being a school librarian. So it is a time for them to think about you're not in teacher role. You're not in teacher role. And we do do some role playing in that course because they often fall back to that comfort zone of if I was a teacher, this is what I would do, but you're not the teacher. Another uh, element of this that I always like to stress is you are having to the needs of everyone at your school. And if you're trying to serve the needs of everyone, you're making some tough decisions that everybody's not going to be happy. You have a a limited amount of resources. None of us have uh, this billion dollar budget. Therefore, when you have to make those choices of what best is the needs of of all, there's somebody that you're going to have to say no to. So you're going to have to start practicing that and start to think about that. I especially have this conversation with those people who have determined, well, my librarian at my school is going to retire. So I'm going to start this program because when that person retires, I can have a job. This is where I'll be. And I, I, I like to say to them, you may not want that role because you've established your relationship with them as a peer. And not that as a librarian, you are an administrator, but in many ways for the management of the resources, you're having to look at it through a different lens. Even down to the best example I always give them is um, when you are teaching as peers, a person can come into your classroom and you all have a relationship that if she needs this resource or he needs this resource, they know that you're okay with it and you can pick that item up and walk out and go use it in your class, and they're fine because you you have that relationship. But when you're in the library and you're responsible for inventorying everything there, no one, you can't have people just walking in and picking things up and walking away. And you're going to have to set some boundaries to know that I am your friend and we had that relationship, but in my new role, We have to have boundaries. You can't do this. You may be privy to some information that you can't share with everybody. You may be tasked with some things. And I can remember that as a school librarian, my principal asking me to go offer some support to someone about something that they were doing in their classroom. And I couldn't, I had to really think about what was going to be my relationship with this person. And I almost went in with don't shoot the messenger. It's been identified that you need some assistance and I'm here to offer the resources that can help you do what you need. Don't be upset with me because you think, well, who is she to tell me that this is the assistance? And it's not me telling you, but I've been tasked with offering you the help that you need. So you got to think about it in from a managerial kind of role. And I think, Truly, I didn't know this when I was doing it, but the courses that I took in ed leadership really helped me kind of help them understand the changes in that collegial relationship. Well, and I, I think that a, a message that was I, I got loud and clear when I was in library school is, is my, my role as a support. I am, I am here to help everybody do their job better, whether it is my students doing their job, whether it's the teachers doing their job, or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm supporting my principal and the building administration to reach whatever goals they have set for that academic year. And if my job is to help other people shine and I'm okay with that, like it's, it's a, it's a, mm-hmm. I am fine with that. And 
I don't know if that f- suits everybody's personality, but to be a support role, to help other people do their job, you know, to me sounds wonderful, but I, I don't know if it sounds wonderful to other people. And I know for me, I wanted to be the person people could come to for help because I was in a similar situation, yeah. but I was the teacher who needed help. And I, I, I have, I know I've told this story on the podcast before, but I was strapped with the worst teaching assignment. I had four preps first semester and then three different preps second semester. And I taught high school. I taught all the electives in the social studies department because I I was the (laughs) first hire in 14 years. So each of my counterparts taught one class five times and I got all the electives. And I think I was on the verge of of tears most days. And I went to Carla, the librarian, and I knew she, she didn't evaluate me. And I just had a falling apart and I just said, I am not, I am not doing a good job and I need your help, but I need, I need to know that this isn't going to go anywhere. I need help, but I, I would be embarrassed if, if my yeah. coworkers who just hired me six months ago knew that I was in over my head because they screwed me with this awful schedule and they're all sitting there with this, <laughs> the, you know, the, the class, they haven't, you know, changed a, the, a, a darn thing in, in 10 or 15 years. And I'm, I'm given, oh, yeah, and, and I was given, I was given every elective the school offers in the social studies department. I was furious, <laughs> but Carla, the librarian held my hand and my God, she kept my secret and she helped me every step of the way that year. And that was my light bulb moment. That was like, you know what? I want to be Carla. (laughs) I I want to be, I want to be the librarian who fixes other people's problems. So I I love that, that that's a, a message that you give your students. You also teach a class, um, 583 library media programs. Can you share how you prepare students for the challenges they can expect in their careers as school librarians? That particular course is very student achievement focused. So it's a course that they really have to look at how do I design programming that impacts the student achievement goals at a particular school? How do I identify what those goals are? How do I advocate for what I can do to help meet the goals? And how do I design uh, the Different programs so that the students' goals are met, and it's it's interesting at times, and it's so crazy for me. I will teach those two classes, EDM 581 and 583, at the same time, and the students sometimes are taking it at the same time, and we're very confused over what assignment are you doing to do this, and what assignment are you doing to do that, and it, at times it gets a little confusing for all of us. But truly, that is the course where they have to develop and know how do I meet student needs? How do I not just know how to manage the area, but what am I developing and how am I taking things forward? So it's a fun course. I mean, I I hate to say this, but I tell my students every course I teach is fun to me. And it's an important course. And they go. Yeah, because I go, every course you teach is, every course I teach is the most important course that you will ever take in the program. I go, ooh, I've told you that about the last (laughs) course too, because they are to me all three. It's one that they have to have that. If I'm not mistaken, is the message that the priorities that school librarians set for themselves need to coincide with the priorities that the building principal has set or the goals that, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you can have your goals for your library space and for your collection and your programming, but it all, invariably what becomes important in the library is going to reflect what's important in the building, the the priorities set by the building administrators or, uh, you know, whenever there are those initiatives that have been taken on by the district. I mean, we have to be team players, don't we? And we have to think about buy-in. You can design all kinds of lovely programming, but if that programming is not aligned to the goals in the school and, the, the, and aligned to district-wide goals, you're not going to get the buy-in. And it, it, nothing I would think would be more dis, more disheartening than developing something, this content, and nobody participates. Or you do this great idea about something and you get no one to come and be a part of it. 
So you must look at what are the goals at, at the school and how can I best do things to reach, help them reach those goals. We're all in it together. It also gives you, in that particular course, an opportunity to reach out beyond your school community. Uh, they can do things with public libraries. They can do things with university libraries. They can do things with other groups around the communities that have an interest in the school. Because if they have an interest in the school and they see that you have an interest in the school and some of your goals align, then quite often you'll get the buy-in from them to really move and do the things that you would want to do. And I'm always so excited when I see that, that light bulb moment go off for students that, hey, hey, I don't have to just depend on this one particular way to make this work. I can actually tap into a lot of different ways and partner with people, partner with the counselor, or partner with the PTA, or partner with other groups within the school, with sports teams. Partner with people to move your programming forward. Partner with arts and music, too. Sorry, my bad. I can't, I never can leave them out. I'm the mom of a musician. Gotta always say I, arts I and have music. two musicians. I get it. <laughs> I do. Am I correct that you supervise the practicum experiences of pre-service teachers and school librarians? And this program has a completion of an A, a B, and a C internship. I, I need to know the difference between all of those. <laughs> yes, I am the person who supervises their internship. So you are correct on that, first and foremost. And the A, B, and C uh, coincide with the fact that in the state of Alabama, you are required to do 300 hours of practicum or internship experience, 300 hours. So we break it into 100-hour components. And we align each of those 100-hour components to a specific course because our students aren't waiting until the end of their coursework to do practicum. They're doing practicum throughout the program. It's a good experience. And what better way to take theory into practice than to learn about it in a course and then the next semester do an internship where you actually get an opportunity to see what you've learned about in the previous course in action. So, Internship A is tied to Media Center Management, EDM 581. So they do, they, their internship addresses the standards that, of things that they learned in that course. E, uh, internship B is tied to the Information Literacy course. So they go out and they do their internships there. And from internship C is tied to the, the you know, EDM 583, the Library Media Programs course. So they get an opportunity to do, to see how that works out in the real world in doing their internship. And they also get, they're required by the state to do 150 hours in a school setting. And the other 150 hours can be in a school setting or it can be in other types of libraries. I like for uh, students, I strongly encourage them to do uh, elementary school, um, secondary school, and then I like for them to do something with the public library and do something or with our university library. Our university library has been a great partner with us in uh, having the students come there, see how a university library works. And they love the fact that our students who work with them are teachers. And in many cases at the university library, they have to offer those classes to freshman English and do that academic library work. So our students come in with that K-12 experience and the technology know-how that they are doing some really fantastic partnering with them at the university library. At the public library, they uh, one of the ways that they do that internship, they love them when it's time for the summer reading program. Oh my gosh, they love our interns because they're teachers. So they know about how do I do management of groups of students at one time when a, when 30 kids decide to come for story time? Our students, having that educational background, bring not just the classroom management part, but also just the things that you know about how to design a lesson or an activity, how to evaluate the lesson or activity. So it's a learning experience for them of how the public library works. But it's also a great partnership so that when they become school librarians, they'll know the resources that the public library has and can do library cards, can do all types of things with their partners 
in their network that they've met at the public library and at the university library. So I'm always thinking, I'm a connector. That's just my the way I view things. So any way that I can build those connections, that's what I strive but, for. But, you know, what a, a, a credit to this program because it recognizes the value of, of school librarians having that exposure in the public library. I, I've only ever been in the public library as a patron and now as a, a, somebody who collaborates with them on, on activities. But, you know, to have this expectation in your program and it's built in, you know, and to have, uh, you know, 100 hours here and 100 hours there and 100 hours there, it is such a rich experience because you have, you've given some foundation to the students wherever they, they go moving forward. I, that is, I've not heard of that kind of arrangement and I, I think your, your students are going to benefit from it tremendously. is that much um, like student teaching, school librarian practicums can be incredibly varied in the range of opportunities and experiences that one would have uh, between, say, members of that cohort. I know my experience was different from my friends who were also doing their practicums. Is it possible somehow to like create a, a, a must-do list of, of things that you know, these pre-service uh, school librarians should should tackle uh, before they they move into a library. I know we mentioned at the top of this conversation, just basic book repair. I, I've never seen a, a librarian repair a book until I went into a library and I was like, okay, I want to watch you do this. There is a checklist, but there's not a checklist. There is there are standards that they have to meet. And what I ask them to do is to sit down with the librarian, their supervisor and librarian, before they do anything. And what they end up doing at the end, because I just had this conversation with an intern, and what they decided they were going to do at the beginning may not be the exact same thing. And that's fine. But I want them to start with an action plan so that they do have some things that they can satisfy within themselves that, hey, I did learn how to do this. I did learn how to do that. I am hesitant to give a pure checklist only because I feel that there are some people just knowing certain types of personalities that if you gave them a checklist, <laughs> they would just check things off and say, I did this, I did this, I did that. And usually we, I bring out said checklist when I think that there's been some experiences that they have not had. Or if I'm talking to the supervising librarian and I say, well, it'd be great if they learn how to do this. So here's a little checklist as a cheat sheet for them of make sure they know how to do this and make sure they know how to do that. I also recognize, though, that there's so many things that I wouldn't think of that they need to see. So I kind of put that in the hands of the supervising school librarian to say, OK, you know, the other stuff that I've probably forgotten or didn't know, or just would not even think about. Make sure they do that. Our biggest thing, though, this year, we were in, we had gone to spring break, and we never went back to -to face-to-face classes. So we ran through this situation of what does it mean to be a librarian in post, well, not even post, in the pandemic era. I had, some decisions had to be made of, how much of what you needed to know how to do needed to be virtual. I always tell people immediately, when we say 100 hours, we don't mean 100 hours of you sitting behind a desk checking out books. If only that was the only thing you had to do, oh my goodness, you'd have it made in the shade. So we don't mean 100 hours of doing that. You have so many varied experiences. And we had to determine, the world we, I had to determine what were those things that could be done virtually? Many of our school librarians in, in this area moved them to the platform, the Schoology platform that the teachers were using to do their services. So our pre-service school librarians had to learn how to offer services in a virtual way. Uh, this summer in their technology for school librarians course, I saw that a lot of people were doing Bitmoji class, Bitmoji library. So, of course, even though this wasn't an initial game plan, I had to pivot 
and include an activity where they built a Bitmoji school library uh, interface because I wanted them to be prepared in how we were now doing things. So a lot of things that they're doing are virtual. Their internship is not virtual. There is no, no such thing as a virtual internship. But there are experiences within their internships that are virtual because if you're going to be a librarian in 2021 forward, you better be just as skilled in a virtual setting as you are in a face-to-face -face setting in bricks and mortar because one never knows what you will have to do. Wow. You know, I, I that's, again, you know, a teachable moments and, and having, you know, we've, we've all been building the plane while we're flying it. And, you know, library school is no different. And the truth of the matter is, I mean, what an opportunity for your students to recognize the need to be ready to adapt to the ever-changing circumstances under which we we teach. And, you know, I, I know that that's a skill that doesn't come as easily to some as it does to others. But, you know, I think when you are in the school library, you do have to be ready to table the things that you might have expected you were going to do and shift gears when you know, your yes. building needs you to. And, you know, yes. there you can't cling to what you had planned because when circumstances such as the ones we're living in require, we have to be able to support our buildings in any way that, that, that you know, necessitates. I was going to say, I also think about it in terms of this, even pre-pandemic. In many cases, the library is the heart of the school. I mean, we like to say that we're the heart of the school. And I remember having this conversation with a group of students where we were looking at images of school libraries. This wasn't for design class. I think this was just to think about what a school library can look like. And I said, well, if you were to take that image and put it in a map of a school, what do you start to notice? And in a lot of cases, it's a large space. It's a, a, a space that is an easily accessible space. And that lends itself to you have to be prepared on any given day that someone, not you, will determine that, hey, instead of doing this today, we're now going to do this and you're going to be the hostess or host for said event. And you can't say, well, no, I'm going to shut it down. We're not going to do that. No, you have to shift. You have to be ready to take whatever you were planning and do it in a totally different way. And if you are now going to host the award ceremony, be ready because it happens. Yes. And, and, oh, and every yeah. baby shower and, and every birthday party and all that food is coming into your library too. And I, I, I have a whole episode on communal space because I, I think that that was a very hard thing for me as a, as a 10 year educator to walk into this very public uh, classroom, uh, this library, and be like, this isn't mine. I, I am here, but this space uh, is, is not mine. And, I, you know, the idea of referring to something as my library, well, you get, get rid of that right away because it's not your library. It is our library. <laughs> you are a steward of the, the, of the space, but it is not your space. You can customize mm -hmm. it. You can make it user-friendly. You can do a lot mm -hmm. of things, but... You want it to be that space. You want it to be that space that people feel comfortable with coming to you and asking you, can I do this? Or if they have to tell you sometimes that, yes, we will do Absolutely. this. And you want them to have that kind of relationship Absolutely. with you. Absolutely. You're a team player. You know, I'd love to hear, uh, would you share with listeners, because the University of South Alabama's Library Media Certificate Program and Degree Program. So you have two different programs. Why might a listener choose one over the other? And by the way, friends, I did include links to both of these uh, plans of work in the show notes. And actually, they are very, very, very similar. The certificate program and the difference between the certificate program and the master's program is that in the certificate program, there it's for people that may already have a master's degree and they're not going to get a second master's degree. So in some cases, some of the support courses, they may have already gotten those courses in their previous master's program. So if, you, if you've already taken Ed Psych, if you've already taken the research course, 
if you've already taken the technology course that most places say you're going to take a site, you're going to take a research course, and you're going to take a technology course. If you've already taken those, generally, in most cases, you are not asked to repeat those courses. You bring in those nine hours with what you've already done. So that's the difference between the two of those. The library courses, you're going to have to take those. The internship, you're going to have to do that. And the state of Alabama requires a diversity course. And in only maybe in newer master's programs was that course required. So most people that come into our program who already have a master's in elementary ed or secondary or something else have not had that particular course. So they end up taking the library courses, the internship, and that diversity course that the state requires. Uh, listeners will want to know, do you have, uh, are these, are these, is the certificate program and the degree program available online? completely online. I actually was in a conversation with someone the other day about synchronous and asynchronous. Our courses are generally synchronous with modules that are open every week or every couple of weeks for the students to do. Uh, but we do do uh, some synchronous time where if I, we bring in a guest speaker or someone uh, that they would all serve by coming together online to, to hear and connect with, do that, but they all 100% online. And that seems to work well for us. That, that really seems to work well. People have so much on their plate. And in the, one of the hats I wear as program coordinator is the student that is their advisor. And so we really have these conversations because I'm doing advisement conversations right about now before we go into a new semester. And I say, what is your life look like? When they say, well, do I need to take this or do I need to take one, two? What should I do? I'm thinking first you need to examine where are you? Is this a good time for you to do two courses or is this a good time for you to do one? We don't necessarily have a cohort program, but we I found that people can start every semester or any semester, but there are groups that end up starting around the same time and they take their together, but we don't specifically do a cohort. I did a cohort when I was working on my doctorate, and I love having that, that team to do things with, and we've explored that. We are truly a growing program. Uh, we have doubled the amount of students, actually tripled the amount of students that are in the program just over the past few years because we are people are still becoming school librarians. You hear a lot of things from folks of, is this still a viable career? Yes, it is a viable career. There are people that are doing it in different ways in different states. But yes, we will need school librarians. I'm going to always say that we need school librarians, not because of what I do, but I feel that the need will always be there. You know, I, I, I feel silly asking this question because I feel so much, I've, I've learned so much about your program, but, you know, can you tell me what is it about South Alabama University that makes it a really great place for aspiring school librarians to get their, their, uh, their training and their degree? I think it's, uh, what makes the University of South Alabama a great place is that it's a personable program. It's, you're not just a number. We're smaller. We really take time to get to know our students and to offer the, them the resources, the content knowledge, the support that they need to successfully move on to their next. We recognize that they come they learn, they grow, and what we can do to support them in that growth is beneficial to us because they then spread the word that this was a good fit for me, and I think it'll be a good fit for others. So I think that that would probably be our, our biggest selling point is that they're going to get uh, an outstanding, I feel, experience, and uh, we want the best for them. We want them to be the best future librarian that they can be. I love it. You know, I, I, I can't miss an opportunity to promote a podcast. You produce a podcast. Would you tell listeners about the podcast that you produce? Because good news, you're talking to an audience who loves to listen to podcasts. I serve as one of the producers on the next 
in a Ed podcast, which can be found on all platforms. Yes, we're out on, on all anywhere that you listen to podcasts. And it's a podcast about what is next in education. We don't, we, we talk to a variety of people from educators, from people that are interested in educational technology. We've talked to some international educators. We've talked to some policymakers. Uh, we've had interviews with people that support education in terms of offering after school programs and other types of things like that. We talked to people on the university level, higher ed, and how they support education and really get asked from a cross section of the population of what do they feel will be next in ed. If we had this crystal ball, how, what, how was their journey that got them to where they are in education and where do they think, based upon that knowledge, we're going next? So Next in Ed is a really great podcast, and I enjoy being a producer on it. Friends, I will be putting a link in the show notes. Um, Dr. Moore, this has been an absolute just joy, and I, I, I miss library school, and talking to you makes me miss it more. Would you please share with listeners, because you know so many of the listeners add guests to their PLN. Could you tell listeners how to find you on social media, please? Yes, I can be found on Twitter at, <clears throat> at Pam Moore Tech. P A M M O O R E Tech T E C H, and um, that's probably the best place to find me. As a on Facebook, I am a member of many of the school library groups that you find on Facebook. So if you see Pam Moore there and see my wonderful smile, you'll know. Oh, that was the Pam Moore that I heard on the podcast. So though, there are two places that you can find me there. The on Instagram, I'm there. But not necessarily in the same way, but definitely on Twitter and on Facebook, you will find me. If they're talking about librarianship, I'm there. Dr. Moore, I am so grateful. I know it's such a busy time of the school year. And, you know, for making time to speak with us, because I, I know a lot of listeners are, are looking to further their degree. And I know a lot of listeners are looking for a place to land and, and, and you know, pursue their, their uh, continuing their education. So thank you so much for spending this evening with us today. You are so welcome. This was wonderful. And any information that I can share, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I enjoyed talking about librarianship and am happy to be a, a, a person, a resource for anyone should they need me. Thanks again, Dr. Moore. I'm so grateful that Dr. Moore was able to take time out of her busy schedule to share with us some perspectives as one sees them from library school. If you found this episode helpful, please share it out with your team, your PLN, and on social media. Now is a great time to remind everyone, if your district permits you to submit hours of listening to podcasts for professional development credit, I do have a link in our show notes to an editable form which you can complete and submit digitally. If you don't know if your district accepts podcast listening for PD, ask. You certainly can't beat the price or the convenience or the customizing ability you have to choose what you're listening to that day. I currently have three episodes in the works, and I don't know which one will be posted next. But what I can tell you is that all of them are full of strategies and resources and perspectives, and I am so excited to share these conversations in the coming weeks. I hope you will tune in. 